And when you chop that, you know, cut that tree down and replace it with a sapling, you know, people tend to think, you know, it's a renewable resource, but that sapling is definitely not sequestering that carbon out of the atmosphere the same as the mature tree that it's replacing. And then even when they consume the wood in that old tree, only about 50% of that wood is actually used. The rest is turned into sawdust, There's the branches are cut off. You know, there's a whole lot of the tree which isn't actually turned into valuable wood that is used in making products. You know, I thought it would be, uh, we can just 3D print wood. <laughs> that was the idea and I, I, my collaborators, uh, Ronald Rail and Virginia Sanfratello, all of us had an interest in 3D printing wood and using essentially using waste materials to upcycle them to make useful objects. Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani and I'm your host Vidya Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic, and environmental practices. Today, we have with us Andrew Jeffrey, co-founder and co-inventor of Forest, a greener future through 3D printed wood. He joins us from Burlington, Mass. Welcome, Andrew. Hello, Vidya. It's a pleasure to be here. So what percent of our forests, how many trees are cut down every year? There's something like 50 billion trees, I think, cut down. That number is, I don't know how many are cut down, but, you know, how much sawdust is generated every year from those, the processing of those trees. But mankind has been engaging in tree cutting activities since time immemorial, right? So... Is it just the volume has increased so much now that it's causing a problem? One of the big problems is the all of the older large diameter trees have been cut down and people are now resorting to chopping down or using small diameter timber or small diameter trees uh, to make products. And mm -hmm. it's increasingly creating difficulties in making products and one of the other things is the shortage of timber has led to sort of illegal harvesting of very valuable timbers like teak, you know, some of the ebonies and things like that where these forests are protected and people are desperately trying to get that wood so they're being illegally uh, forested to uh, meet that demand. So when they say that for every tree that they cut down, they plant X number, like two or three, you're saying that is not sufficient because the tree that they cut down is probably 30, 40 years old. Yeah, the old trees, you know, they're 30 or 40 years old and they're consuming a ton of carbon over their lifetime. And when you chop that, you know, cut that tree down, and replace it with a sapling, you know, people tend to think, you know, it's a renewable resource, but that sapling is definitely not sequestering that carbon out of the atmosphere, the same as the mature tree that it's replacing. Mm -hmm. As well as the younger tree not consuming the carbon, just the destruction of that space where that tree stood releases a lot of carbon into the atmosphere as well. So I think sometimes mistakenly think that, you know, because another tree grows, it's a renewable resource. But in terms of, you know, carbon capture, it just isn't the same as leaving that existing tree there. That's a really interesting uh, point of view. We always just think one-to-one -one replacement, but the carbon capture component of that, we kind of tend to overlook and ignore. So does United States lead in deforestation or are there are other countries who are ahead of us? I think the, the U.S. is fairly good with its, I think the number of trees is, I was up at a wood manufacturing conference last couple of weeks ago, and, you know, they were saying in, in the state of Maine that there are more trees now growing than there were when Europeans came to the country. They're all sort of, yeah, we're sustainable, but, you know, they sort of neglect to mention that cutting down that the old trees is sort of removing this great resource, which once it's gone, it's gone. And then even when they consume the wood in that 
old tree, only about 50% of that wood is actually used. The rest is turned into sawdust. There's the branches are cut off. You know, there's a whole lot of the tree which isn't actually turned into valuable wood that is used in making products. Talking about forestry, one of our earlier guests, their products were made with the sustainable wood from Canada. And from what I recall, the Canadian government let you go in and cut when they decided that the tree was ready to be cut or there were enough trees that were it was okay to cut. Did you know about that program? No, I didn't don't know about that specific program, although there are sort of sustainable strategies for harvesting timber where you know largely preserve the forest and sort of cut down wood in specific diameters and you know you keep some of the older trees in place to uh, preserve the sustainability of the forest. What's wrong with sawdust because it's biodegradable? Well, when it degrades, it releases carbon into the atmosphere. And also a lot of the sawdust is is burnt or incinerated. You know, much of it is used as a sort of a low-grade fuel source in other wood processing applications. And it's, you know, it ends up either just lying on the forest floor, it gets burnt, some of it is landfilled. It's a huge waste stream that a lot of companies that are using wood products Uh, struggle to work out what they're going to do with it. Some of it has turned into engineered wood like uh, particle board or medium density fiber board, but there's a significant proportion of it which is not used and, you know, it just ends up in landfills or, or incineration. How much sawdust is generated? You know, 50 billion trees are cut. That's worldwide. But say we just focus closer to home in the United States, In the US, there's about 84 million tonnes of sawdust generated every year. That's a huge quantity of material. That equates to around 30 million trees. You know, that's a very large number of trees. So that resource is, some of it is used, as I mentioned, in making engineered wood products, but a lot of it is just ends up in landfill or just left on the floor of the forest or, you know, disposed of with incinerators or other other types of disposal methods. So a tremendous amount of it is not used in a way that helps the environment or creates useful products. That's a pretty big number. What is your background? Do you have a background in forestry or are you an engineer looking to solve a problem? Yeah, this chemical engineering, but I had no knowledge of wood till I started this company. You know, I thought it would be, uh, we can just 3D print wood. So that was the idea. And I, I my collaborators, uh, Ronald Rail and Virginia Sanfratello, we'd worked together previously on a number of projects, 3D printing projects. Mm-hmm. And all of us had an interest in 3D printing wood and using essentially using waste materials to upcycle them to make useful objects. And we talked about, you know, starting a company for quite a few years. And eventually the opportunity for me emerged to do that. And I called Ron up and I said, well, let's just do it. And uh, that was it. We started Forest and it's been a great adventure. That's for sure. I must add, forest is spelled F-O-R-U-S-T. Yes, our slogan was forests are for us. And uh, that was how we came up with the name. So you have a couple of co-inventors. Yes, Ronald Rail and Virginia Sanfratello. Whose idea was it to think about this? Was it a team effort? Ron and Virginia had worked in 3D printing wood. They're both academic architects. Ron had looked at using a whole range of materials or non-conventional materials for 3D printing. For instance? Oh, salt, agricultural waste, coffee grounds, anything that he could get which was just a waste stream, he'd try 3D printing that. My experience in 3D printing was with ceramics. So it sort of led me to looking at architectural applications. And I was interested in wood and actually tried it out back in 2015. But it just sort of wasn't, the pieces just didn't fit together exactly right. 
And Ron and I had actually toyed with doing something together then, but it was the same on his side. The pieces weren't exactly right. Were you doing this as part of your job or just as a side gig or you were doing it full time, just dedicating to this invention? It was just, a, I'm a serial entrepreneur and it was just, ceramics was our business, but, you know, was looking at wood as well, just to see if we could expand the product offerings that we were making and to see if there was a business in 3D printing wood. Mm-hmm. You know, I even registered a company and bought a printer and sort of did everything to sort of get started, but I couldn't, there just was a little bit missing. And I think the missing piece was Ron and Virginia. And for them, they couldn't get really get it going because the missing piece was me Mm -hmm. so I had the sort of the business you know the ability to sort of organize the company and all that sort of stuff and the the 3d printing expertise and they had the the create creativity um, some materials expertise and designs so when we put those two together it was you know we said wow okay let's do this together and that's what we did How did you three know each other, socially or...? Just really professionally. I had, uh, when I started uh, my previous ceramics company, I followed Ron on his Instagram account. He was doing some interesting designs and we collaborated way back in, I think, 2012, 2013 on some projects where he designed some ceramic objects and then we made them and sent them over to UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So we had a a fairly rich sort of set of collaborations over the years. You know, I just always liked working with Ron and Virginia and uh, they have a great way of thinking about 3D printing, which engineers sometimes don't have. They sort of come at it from a very different perspective, you know, made some really interesting designs. And I was always just fascinated with their approach to the whole process. One way to think about it is that when you're an architect or you are a good artist, you just put your ideas on paper, but you probably aren't thinking of how you're going to actually make a 3D version of it, right? So maybe that was the part that they did and you came in and brought in the engineering capabilities to bring their ideas from the paper to reality. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things I have worked with artists quite a lot over the over my years in 3D printing. And one of the things that I think I've been good at is actually sort of turning those ideas into reality. That's always been sort of one of the things that's excited me about 3D printing is being able to turn these, you know, sketches into a real object. It's been a fabulous to work with both of them. Let's segue to additive manufacturing. So what is additive manufacturing? Additive manufacturing is creating objects by adding material to build the object up layer by layer. And it's completely different from, say, machining an object where you start with a solid block and you carve the material away and you create the object that way. In our process, we do that using powder. So we spread thin layers of powder and we join it together using an inkjet printhead. And um, where the powder is joined together, that forms the part that we then create. Though 3D printing has been around for a long time, it's hard for people who are visualizing your you know, your regular printer, which is printing your document, to uh the 3D printing, which print auto parts to, I know kids who are doing science fair projects now can send out a design and have a thing printed. So just explain, how does it go? So how big is your machine, for instance? We're using a fairly small platform uh, in production, but we're right now, but we're developing a much larger platform, which has the potential to print objects up to the size of a door or a large window. Mm -hmm. The way it works is, you know, if you can imagine you take an object and then if you slice that object like a a piece of ham and you slice it into very, very thin slices, each one of those slices is effectively kind of like a page and we load that individual slice into the printer. Mm -hmm. We spread a thin layer of powder which represents that slice and then we have an inkjet printhead which joins the powder together in the shape of that slice. Each slice is sequentially loaded into the machine and the 
inkjet printhead prints that slice and so we end up with a stack of slices that uh, then form the object. So why did you guys arrive on sawdust? Because we're using thin slices we need to be able to spread a thin layer so sawdust not every type of sawdust is suitable but we found the right particle size of the sawdust and the right composition of the sawdust to be able to spread it as a thin layer. And that's the pretty much I always have said, uh, you know, if you can spread powder in a thin layer, we can 3D print an object out of it. And uh, sawdust, we were able to develop the technology to do that, develop the, the printhead so we could actually print on it without the printhead clogging. You know, once we'd worked that out, we had a process. So do you make the machines or do you buy machines and you retrofit it or make modifications? We're part of Desktop Metal, which is a machine manufacturer. So we have been using and modifying the Desktop Metal machines uh, to 3D print wood. Why not just cast it? I understand it's not as cool as 3D printing. Well, casting wood is somewhat difficult. It, it's a, it doesn't melt. It's not a, you know, like a plastic material or a metal. And the other thing is we can, by 3D printing, it allows us to really make shapes that can't be made through casting or molding. You said you use some sort of a glue. So is that glue which binds the wood, um, the sawdust? Is it environmentally safe? What kind of adhesive is it? We're using sort of other biomaterials to uh, put the to glue the sawdust together. One of the exciting materials we're using is actually a waste lignin stream, which comes out of the tree and is a waste material from paper making. And we can use that material to glue the sawdust back together, and effectively we kind of reconstitute the wood into an object uh, using these two waste streams, which we upcycle into into to making our parts. So where do you get your raw material? Like, it'd be hard to scrape sawdust off forest floors. Is it from the manufacturers or? The sawdust we're using now is from furniture manufacturing. You know, when they sand furniture to smooth it out to, to put the finishes on it, creates a lot of sawdust and we get that sawdust, you know, companies that collect that and then we use that sawdust in our process. You said you needed the sawdust to be a particular grain fineness, right? The coarseness. If it is too big, can you get it to your thing or your input has to be only at that level of coarseness? Because we wear a layer process and we spread a thin layer, the sawdust nominally has to be slightly smaller than that layer that we're spreading. Otherwise, as the roller goes over the powder bed, it just sort of drags it away rather than leaving it as a smooth layer. We can grind any sort of wood down to the, or sawdust down to the, the specs that we need. Mm -hmm. The main thing that we are looking for in sawdust that it's clean so it doesn't have glue and other foreign materials in it. So we, we sift for that. You know, if there are big chunks in the sawdust, we also sift those out. But they can be reprocessed again and ground up again. It's fairly straightforward. So Virginia and Ronald are the main designers of the products? Yes, they're our design team. They come up with ideas. We discuss, you know, between us, but they're the sort of the design inspiration and, you know, come up with the designs that we're making. And we also work with other designers as well. So we, we're working with some other well-known designers. What are some of the products that Forest has made thus far? The products are, really, are all pretty much related to interior design. Are they decorative items or are they functional? Yeah, decorator items, housewares. One of the exciting areas we're working in is lighting. And we're working with some really great designers making some some really beautiful lights. And um, that, I think, is going to be a very rich area for us. That's kind of exciting because you can make that like a shade, I'm imagining, very, very thin and almost transparent and translucent, right? 
We don't do super thin with our process, but we can make highly apertured objects so they you can see the sort of the light coming through them. And the 3D printed wood is, you know, we really create a very warm and, you know, really beautiful. It's, uh, you know, the way we finish it. And um, it's different from, you know, metal and glass. It sort of has a warmth that some of those materials don't have. Mm-hmm. You know, we're working with some companies that are just specialist lighting manufacturers and make lamps. And uh, traditionally, a lot of these have been made in plastic and we can provide the warmth that, that wood gives in those products. I would encourage our listeners to go to forest.com to check out the very, very cool products that they have. They're incredible. You know, they're like twisted and unimaginable, like a wood carver's dream literally <laughs> come true. How fast is this printing process? Say I have a bowl, which is about eight inches wide and, you know, has these curves and in you know, shapes. How long will it take? It's pretty fast. It depends on the size of the machine, you know, how many we make. We normally don't just make one object. We'll put a whole lot of objects in the powder bed that we build at the same time. But our machines are typically for, you know, the build volume of 16 litres will do that in, you know, four or five hours. And also that goes on all the time. So we can, you know, switch the machine on before we leave work and it just works away during the night and we come back and we have excavate a whole bunch of really beautiful objects and um, it's one of those things I never get tired of looking at what comes out of the machine it's a it's always a surprise. So as a ceramic artist it's the same excitement when you open the kiln. Yes yeah. (laughs) I spend like 20 years of my life doing ceramics actually so especially like say if it's um Raku kiln. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time you open the kiln. <laughs> so, yeah, so, in four or five hours, like if you had to say pieces, how many pieces? Well, depending on the machine, our large bed machine will be able to do thousands of pieces at one time. With our smaller bed machines that we're starting up with, we can do, you know, anywhere from, you know, three or four to maybe 10, depending on the size of the object. Is that per hour or per five to six hour shift? Per five to six hours. And the parts are fully, you know, they're they're finished objects and we just depowder them and then we you know use a a bioresin material to just increase the strength and then we finish them using conventional stains and lacquers you know other finishes so the the parts can be finished just like a normal piece of wood it's uh you know a very very sort of straightforward process after the 3d printing so how durable is it compared to what it's very durable in fact we're just conducting some durability tests now and I this week I decided to take some of our pieces home and put them in my dishwasher just to give a see what would happen Mm -hmm. you know the parts are hardly barely touched by a you know the heavy duty cycle on a dishwasher so I'm pleasantly surprised with the durability and I think it's a lot more durable than than you know than I was sort of previously thinking. Can you mix two different kinds of wood, like say a mahogany with a teak or a blonde birch with teak? You know, can you mix match or? We're actually doing that now. Our powder blend that we're using is a mixture of oak and maple. The Each wood type has different properties of the sawdust. So some woods are more fibrous, some woods are more powdery, or the sawdust is more powdery. We have to take that those individual wood characteristics into account when we do the 3D printing. But we've had, you know, we've just received some wood from a company in, in New Zealand that we're trying out in our machines. We've had teak from uh, sawdust from companies that make decks for boats. And we've had mahogany from uh, companies that makes windows. So the process is very flexible with different types of woods. Mixing different types together can give us sort of interesting properties as well. So do you still get the wood grains? I love the wood grains that come with. Since it's a printing process, you can print the wood grains. That's exactly what we're doing, where we've developed this process, which we call digital grain. And so we can create a grain structure 
which gets printed into the part, into the piece that we're making, rather than being sort of like a laminated structure on the surface, the grain goes all the way through the part. So you can take one of our, something that we've made, you can refinish it if you want to, and you don't lose the grain structure at all. When you kept talking about moving the wood, this bumper sticker kept coming in my mind. <laughs> Don't move the wood, <laughs> you know, protect trees from bugs. Are we in any risk of that with you bringing wood from New Zealand and moving wood from, say, New Hampshire to Texas or wherever else? That's something I haven't really thought about, but we certainly haven't seen any bugs in the wood that we're getting. But I think, you know, it's obviously something that we'd have to consider if we're scaling the process up. But, you know, most of the wood is already, you know, it's already into the, the piece that's being made. And so it's generally sort of beyond that stage where, you know, we might find a surprise animal or wood borer in the or termite in the wood but um i think by the time it gets through our process i don't think there's probably not many animals still there so how old is this company we just had our second anniversary on monday this week so the 19th so we're we're still uh pretty new still in infancy yeah are there any shapes that your printing cannot do or it is pretty versatile It's pretty versatile. There are shapes that we can't do, particularly very, very thin structures. So if we want to produce something like a veneer, that's difficult for us right now. But we're continuing, we're at the start of the development of this process and we're working on new materials all the time to increase the range of products that we can make. Mm -hmm. We do have some limitations and we have design rules that designers need to be aware of when they're designing for us. But the uh, aim is to reduce those limitations, you know, step by step and, and open up uh, greater design freedom for the people we're working with. Could I submit design that I have in mind or is it it is only a designer who has a relationship with you? You can upload a file on our website right now and uh, we'll review that and let you know if we can make it or not. That's available for, to anyone in the world to upload a file and um, see if we can make their uh, idea. So what has the impact been? You're still in your infancy and where do you think you'll be in three years? You know, the impacts for us is, you know, we're able to source the sawdust locally. We don't have to bring that in from Asia or Africa or anywhere, you know, long distance. We can source all our raw materials locally. We can manufacture locally. So we, we're sort of independent of these complicated supply chains. Yeah, that's one of the big advantages, I think, that we have with the process. You know, we're planning on building a cabin where we can showcase all of the ideas that we have for 3D printing. So that would include, you know, printing the, the wall claddings on the in interior and exterior, even the floorboards for the cabin, uh, furniture pieces. We may even, you know, create all the bowls that we would store, you know, put our fruit in. Anything inside a room that, you know, could be made with wood or made with plastic that we can replace with our 3D printed wood, you know, that's the canvas which we're operating on. So in a few years, I hope, you know, we'll be seeing our products in uh, specified in, in new buildings, in renovations of existing buildings, creating interesting commercial spaces, uh, homewares for, the ha for people's houses, and even, you know, the interior of cars. We are working with making sample parts for some of the major automakers. You know, they're very excited about being able to create a really exotic luxury wood finish using recycled materials. How does your cost compare to the wood, the regular wood, I mean? Our cost is very competitive. Give me an example, please. You know, the design, for example, those vessels that you cited, which were intricately carved, they can't be made conventionally using conventional woodworking techniques. Mm -hmm. You know, those objects are selling on our website between, you know, $30 and $50. 
you know, for panels, we can, you know, make sort of panels and tiles, you know, very competitively in the order of, you know, say $20 a square foot for a set of uh, really nice wood panels. Furniture, we've we've done some preliminary costings on, say, making a chair, and we can make a, a designer chair, very beautiful chair for under $500. So sort of comparable with many designer objects and sort of luxury objects. You know, we expect to drive that price down as we get to a larger platform. The very beginning of optimizing our process, you know, everything is pointing to us being very competitive. Where are you getting funding for your organization? As I mentioned before, we're we're part of Desktop Metal. So we're essentially part of their research and development that's going on. But we're we're a different business to Desktop Metal. Desktop Metal is making 3D printing machines and we're a customer of 3D printing machines and we're we're using those machines to create a business producing furniture pieces and interior design pieces. You mentioned that 84 million tons of sawdust is generated every year in the United States. How much of that do you think you can repurpose and reuse? Well, that's a difficult question. I I would like to think we could use half of that to um, reuse. You know, obviously not all of it is in a form that we can use, but I think, you know, a significant chunk of that I'd like to be able to, you know, turn into products that we make. That's a tremendous amount of material. It's um, equivalent to millions of trees and, you know, it, it's uh, we would have to expand it. You know, we'd be a gigantic company if we were using all of that material. But it's possible. It's definitely possible. You know, the use of timber, I think, in construction you know, in its prevalent making buildings because it, you know, concrete is pretty bad when it's, uh, you know, CO2 and greenhouse effects. Steel is fairly bad as well. And, uh, you know, if wood is, is used, it locks that carbon up for the life of the building. And if we can use the all of the timber from each tree rather than, you know, half of it, I think we have a, you know, a net gain for, you know, for society in terms of uh, preventing greenhouse gases escaping into the atmosphere. You said one of your long-term plans would be to source the raw materials close to where you are right now, Massachusetts. How about setting up plants in Indonesia where it's made or in China or in India where they make it and repurpose the, the wood right there? Exactly right. That's the way we're thinking. That it, it doesn't make any sense to ship sawdust around the world. So yeah, we would put the machines, have the machines or the process locally to uh, making products that meet local requirements using the resources that are local. The one thing we can do is designs can be made anywhere. So we could have you know a designer in Europe creating parts or furniture for a company in Indonesia and uh, everyone in any one of these countries can have access to the best designers, the best creative minds. You know, all you need is, uh, you know, some power and uh, some sawdust and an internet connection. And you can be making the same quality objects that could be made anywhere else in the world. And one beauty about the 3D printing is that you can print two different things in the same line. Yeah, you could be making printing chopsticks and a chair at the same time. That always surprises me. There's no, you know, tooling or, you know, you don't have to gear up to, uh, you know, to make a particular object. And, and that was really apparent to me last week when a, another company said, hey, can you make some golf tees for us? And I said, golf tees, you know, and they said, yeah, you know, we, we don't like the plastic ones and we get all the wood from Asia and we don't like chopping down trees just to make golf tees. You know, we had a design, we put it into the printer and that morning we were making golf tees so it's very very flexible and uh, you know that's again one of the other things that excites me we you know you don't even have to think about uh, how we're going to do it you just have the design and you start the machine and you all of a sudden you've you've made the parts it's magic it is magic one of the things you know I first came across this process 30, 30 years ago and it excited me so much. I said, that's going to be my career. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years. 
So wishing you all the best on your venture. Thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on Mindful Businesses. Thank you very much, Vidya. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. You've been listening to Mindful Businesses, hosted and produced by Vidya Iyer. We would love to hear from you. So please send us a voice note with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Rate and review us on Apple Podcast. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Lafayette, Indiana. Theme music is composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Caitlin Milligan. This is Vidya Iyer with Mindful Businesses.